Another Monday, OG, and a big Monday for us because, well, it's our birthday party. Oh. I like your party hat. You got your party hat on. I wasn't told you there don't was have a party. Your party hat on. Will there be cake? You have your, of course there's going to be cake. You have your, your mug. I got my Kansas City mug. We're ready to go. But you know why we're ready to go? We're ready to go because we had a great weekend. Thanks in part to the men and women serving in our armed forces, keeping everybody safe. Got to give a big shout out on behalf of the men and women here making the Stacking Benjamin Show, the men and women at our priorities. They've changed. It's not just about getting ahead or the constant grind. It's about knowing what you want and focusing on what matters. That's the kind of thinking that went into the completely redesigned 2022 Lexus NX. More than an available 14-inch touchscreen, we gave it an all-new intuitive interface designed to minimize distractions and frustrations. More than an impressive safety system, it is the most advanced standard active safety system ever offered in the Lexus, designed to not only help protect you and your passengers, but others on the road. More than offering gas, turbo, and hybrid options, it's also available as a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. More than a well-designed driver-centric cockpit, it's available with a range of features that any driver can appreciate, like a panorama glass roof, thematic ambient illumination, and a new virtual assistant that can be summoned by simply uttering the phrase, Hey Lexus. To see the new NX and to discover everything it was designed to do for you, visit Lexus.com slash NX, the all-new 2022 Lexus NX. Welcome to the next level. PHEV model available in states, excluding Vermont, that have adopted zero emissions vehicle regulations. Navy Federal Credit Union, big shout out to the people in our armed forces. Let's all go stack some Benjamins together, shall we? Hoorah. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and stackers, you haven't forgotten again, have you? I've been waiting all day in the Facebook group for you to mention that today is our 10-year anniversary. Nothing. Crickets. At least we got you a gift. To discuss the risks and rewards of founding a great podcast uh, or uh, nation, we welcome the author of The Founder's Fortunes, Willard Stern Randall. Oh, yeah, I'll gift you even more just so you feel really guilty about forgetting our anniversary. Listen to what we have in store for you. In our headlines, we'll focus on this roller coaster stock market. Our TikTok Minute will have you thinking that the kids are all right. And then I'll have some risk and rewards based trivia. And now, two guys who have lost and found their Benjamins and are here to help you stack yours. It's Joe and O. J-J-J-J-G. Happy Monday, stackers, and a happy 10 year anniversary to all of you. It feels, you know, it's funny. It doesn't feel like 10 years, OG. It only feels like a decade. Just a shade under a lifetime is what it feels like to me. Can you believe that? 10 years of podcasting. And actually, it does go quickly. I'm as old as you were when we started this. (laughs) Oh, that was really well played, OG. I got to give you props (laughs) for that one. I love it. You guys, it sounds like you're a married couple. It's so cute. Are you 43? 44, yeah. Yeah, you're there. Congratulations. It's a great place to be. Not as good as where I am. So right basically, here. I was negative ten. So now, anyways, it's, so I'm at yeah, zero. It's like everything you did up till now, OG, was just practice. All those mistakes you made, all those horrible things you said, it's forgiven because that was just your warm up to get to where Joe started. I was in my 30s. Well, right. I mean, what are you going to do? You didn't know what the hell you were talking about. All your life has led to this big moment. No, I did, but I was because still a jerk. We are. I know. We are hanging out today with Willard Stern Randall who has a fantastic book talking about the fortunes of our creators of this great nation. We're going to dive into two stories from his book, uh, a guy named George Washington. Not sure if you're familiar with that guy. Big dude sings really well. It, yes. Or Ben, ben Franklin. Who, Everybody cheers when he walks on stage. <laughs> that's how we know him. Oh, yeah. The guy from Hamilton. Oh, love that guy. Yes. Not as much as we love King George. Oh, wait. King George is the bad guy. Oh, hold on. 
We've got that. We've got our TikTok minute. We also have a headline about some recent events happening in the markets. But first, many of you may remember MetPro founder Angelo Poli on the podcast now a handful of times talking about how important proper nutrition really is, both for your health and your bottom line. For those of you that are new stackers, Angelo is the founder of a company I use called MetPro. I have a coach named Jesse who I send my data to. Jesse analyzes the data, tweaks my diet. Uh, We have coaching calls once a week where she tucks me through what the strategy is, where our wins are, where we can do better. And it has helped me during this time of COVID when a lot of people are ballooning, maintain my current health. The team at MetPro has helped not just me, but thousands of individuals transform their bodies by hacking their metabolism. Recently, by the way, they've launched a new tool that allows you to experience the same science and tailored strategy that their experts use. It isn't a food logging tool or workout app. The MetPro app allows you to start tracking, analyzing, and learning what your metabolism responds to best. If you're looking for a high-touch experience working with a metabolic expert, or if you want access to the tools their industry-leading coaches use, visit metpro.co slash SB to take their assessment and speak with their team to learn which option is best for you. Also, stackers are going to get up to one month free when you sign up. So head to metpro.co slash SB to take advantage of this opportunity. Results may vary. We all have unique lives, whether you invested in crypto for the first time this year, own an up-and-coming small business, or are raising rambunctious twins like I did. Luckily, TurboTax Live has experts who can answer your tax questions, walk you through the whole process, or do your taxes for you from start to finish no matter your unique situation. To TurboTax Live experts, an interesting life can mean an even greater refund. Visit TurboTax.com to learn more. You do your thing. They've got your taxes. Into it, TurboTax Live. Our big 10-year anniversary show kicks off right now. Let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from The New York Times. It is written by Jeff Summer. And the piece, OG, how to survive when stocks behave badly. Turns out, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, stocks have been behaving a little badly lately. And we got a bunch of listeners who might, it might be their first foray into this jungle. Uh, Yeah, market was down a little bit in January. February's turned out to be okay so far. Where is the stock market heading? Jeff writes. Oh, I know. Oh. (laughs) This can be an urgent question especially if you're losing money in a fickle market as the wild stock market swings that started last week demonstrated. Nobody knows where the market's going, not hour by hour, day by day. What's more, no one on Wall Street's been able to predict reliably where the market will be next month or next year, though plenty of people are constantly trying to do so. Really, we're all in the dark. And when stocks are shaky, that's not a pleasant place to be. Yet there are compelling reasons to stay in the market. Moment like this one, when the stock market's perils are obvious, can be an opportunity, a time to figure out whether your investments are appropriate and to take action or they're not. He's he's talking about people look at if they miss January, they're looking at their their statements or they're they're hearing this like, oh, the market's down. They're pulling up their their Ameritrade account and they go, oh, 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 I might be a little bit uh, shy of the numbers I thought I was at. And then we do the thing that we always do, OG, because we see it all the time. We start redeeming our stuff. We decide now that the damage is done, we're going to lock it in, and it and it gets worse, which is, to Jeff's point, the worst thing to do. Absolutely, it's the worst thing to do. I mean, all you have to do is just change the time horizon that you're looking back. You know, if you go, well, it says that I'm down 9% this month. Okay, cool. Now look at two months. Oh, I'm even money. Now look at a year. Oh, I'm up 7%. Okay, that's fine. Now look at two years. I'm up 17%. You can't make investment decisions based on short-term time horizon and then try to make a long-term investment decision based on those 30 days. It's just it's counterproductive in a big way. And it works the other way too, but more recently, you know, having it go the other way just it's so painful to watch. How many how many times though can people say over and over you should hang in there? And yet you still get the same question from people, which is, I know people say to hang in there, but there's got to be a way to beat this. Like, I feel like maybe it's our human instinct that we think, 
we have a bias toward action, right? When things are going bad, that means I got to finally get up and do something. So there must be something, OG, that we can do that'll make this better. Like it seriously seems like we're on this, uh, you know, those rides that shoot up like at an amusement park feels like we're on one of those rides and the person operating it, people like you and I are, go- by the way, we're not operating the stock market, but just to be clear, people operating it though, we're the puppet masters of this yes, whole thing, <laughs> Yes, that they're messing with you, that they're pranking you. And actually this is a, uh, this is a TikTok video, two people getting on one of those rides and listen to the ride operator messing with them. And right as they think their seatbelts are too loose, he lets it go. Yeah, this should be illegal. I, I, this is uh, cruel and unusual punishment. To that is so cruel, isn't it? Oh, wait, your seatbelts are too. Oops, I started the ride. Yeah. Yeah, but you but you know, people think there is this inside language going on, OG, that we're telling people to sit tight and there's something we should be able to do. There's some invisible force that it's conspiring against them. Or maybe not conspiring against them, but there's a next level, right? Oh, little people, you guys just sit, sit, well... The big people, we we go while, ahead while and move the adults talk. Around. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, the action that you should take is reflect on what you were thinking the last time the stock market was at that point. So, I'm not looking at the data here, but let's just assume that the end of January numbers were equal to the end of October numbers. What was what were all the headlines then? Oh, the market said it's too high. It's too high. You know, gone up too fast. And so it's at the same level it was four months ago or six months ago or whatever. And knowing what you know now, you have the benefit of seeing the stock market go up over that period of time. So you know that that's what's coming. Now you get to go back in time and be put on the same spot nine months ago in terms of where the valuation is. Why would you not want to put more money in if you already see the future? Yeah. Like this is where this is headed. And now it went backwards holy crap, what a great opportunity. Can you change your 401k contributions instead of doing 10%? Can you do 20% for the next couple of months and put a little bit of extra in? Can you front load your Roth contributions right now? You know, because you're getting yesterday prices and I'm using yesterday figuratively, right? You're using, you know, you're getting mid 2021 pricing. That doesn't mean that it's not going to be 2019 pricing in six weeks from now. (laughs) You know, you might... I'd have that too, but that's why dollar cost averaging works. Well, that's what I was going to say was that that, that, that's why buy the dip kind of drives me crazy because people assume they know when the dip is going to stop. And if you go in and you're going to buy more now, realize that you're getting better pricing, but you might not be getting the the lowest price because nobody knows where it is. But well, sure. But if you had a plan, what I'm saying here is sure we do the dollar cost average plan up, right? So you say, okay, I'm going to put in 10% of my, of my paycheck every single week into my 401k. And so that's your plan on the upside. Why don't you have a plan on the downside? Why don't you say, if the market goes down, you know, if the S&P is down 10%, then I'm going to do this. If the S&P is down 15%, then I'm going to do this. If the S&P is down 25%, then I'm going to do this. And so, you know, you've got a plan on the upside. You've got a plan for, you know, if I hit 3 million, I retire. You know, what happens if you hit 500K from a million? Then what do you do? You have to think about that stuff in advance, because if you do, then you'll be looking for that opportunity. I saw a great article from uh, Josh Brown, who's a uh, financial planner in New York, big presence on the internet. Reform Broker is his uh, name. But um, he wrote an article about this, and I thought it was great. What he did to kind of psych himself up is every time there's a pullback, he thinks of companies' stocks that he wished that he was owning at obscenely low prices. Like, oh man, I really wish I could have got Starbucks at 60 a share. And then he goes in his brokerage account and places a $60 Starbucks order for 100 shares or whatever. Good till canceled. And that way, he's taking action. He's saying, you know what? If this is going down and I really wish I could have got Starbucks at 60 bucks a share, it's at 160 today. Why not put in that stupid offer 
Yeah, some idiot wants to sell it to me for 60 bucks, I'll buy it. He wants to panic, I'll profit from his panic. I love this idea of visualization, though, about he gets this visualization yeah. of, of, hey, this is what I could do. I mean, it's almost, it's, al- it's almost like this. We're walking around the store, and we hear the message. Attention, Kmart shoppers. Welcome to our store closing sale, where everything in the store is now 20 to 50% off. Looking for some great deals on clothing? All outerwear in the store is now 50% off. Outerwear, 50% off. All ladies' clothing is now 50% off, while Claire's merchandise within the department have even greater discounts. Also, stop by our shoe department. We're all footwear for your family. Shoe now department. 40% off. Tech stocks. We'd also like you to know Healthcare. that our fixtures equipment are now for sale. Please see any associate for details. And as always, thank you for shopping your student bill, Kmart. I don't think that this is a store closing sale. I think the store is going to remain open. But I think that every time, ooh, it's a Kmart special. I'm getting a sale, OG. Well, it's certainly not fun. You know, I mean, when you look at your investment statements on December 31, you're like, cool, I've got 100 grand. And then you look at it on January 31, like you're supposed to, you don't, you don't pay attention to it throughout the month. And then you get one statement and it's like 87. You're like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything. It just happens. The ups and downs just happen. The last thing that I'll say about this is, if you have an opportunity to learn more about what is normal, I think that goes a long way to providing some comfort on what you're experiencing. Well, can we dive into that? Because I have some numbers there. Yeah, let's dive into it. So JP Morgan has a great resource called Guide to the Markets. In there, it, there's a slide, I don't know what page it's on, but it goes through the, the returns over the last 40 years of the S&P, and then what was the high watermark to low watermark drawdown throughout each year? And the average decline in a year is approximately 14%. And so you look and you say, well, I know the S&P average is 10 up a year. How does it go down 14 and still average 10? What we're saying is, is that there's, there's a point at time where it's up, and then there's a point throughout the year where it's down, and then it finishes on December 31 on average 10% higher than it started January 1. So it's that, you know, that up and down, up and down, up and down. Meanwhile, it's going up. So until you get to 14% down, until you get to a minus 14, you're not even average yet. 14 is average. So if you remember a big number and then you go down 14, yeah, that's pretty much average. Let's go into those specific numbers because I really like this train of thought. Jeff writes, stocks really haven't fallen that much. The point you're making, OG, not when you consider how high they've gone. He said when the latest part of this bull run which started in March 2020, we can actually take it you know, back to what, 2008, 2009, and go back much, much further. But this latest run through January 3rd, when the recent decline began, the S&P 500 returned 114% from March 2020. It was up 114%. So to your point, you're only down a few months. Stock returns have been marvelous over much longer periods too, he says, since March 2009. It's been up 762%, including dividends. Go back a bit further, you'll find in the 50 years from the start of 1972, it's up more than 18,000%. And let's take these downturns that you're talking about one by one. Bear markets in the last 50 years, February to March 2020, 34% down. Yep, minus 34. In 2007, Till March 2009, it went down 57%. That was... Those were the days. That, 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 was, that was the big one. And you talk about how nasty this is. The thing that... Well, let me go through the rest of these numbers. 2000 to 2002, remember that one? 49%. 34% in 1987. And that was just, if you remember, that was a short... That was a knife. Uh, streak down and then right back up. 27% from 80 to 82 and 48% from 73 to 74. So those Yeah, and that doesn't count the ones that were dangerously close to counting either because there were a number of times between especially in this last decade where the closing value finished down, you know, minus 19.7. Yeah. It just never ticked into the official bear market category by closing below 20 and um and so that doesn't show up on that radar screen because there's there's a couple more minus 19.8s in there too that aren't official air quotes but they officially happened yeah well and and that's the thing remember the i mean talk about a decade of podcasting the number of times you and i have had this headline segment where we're chatting about the fact 
that uh, there's all these headlines talking about the world is falling and we're not even in the bear market yet. Those are the ones that didn't even appear yeah. on the screen. So we are not there. You know, what's frustrating for me. And this is kind of interesting for me to, to see these numbers in black and white, because for me, 2000 to 2002 felt worse than 2007, 2008. I don't know about you. And you know what that was, OG? For me, that was experience. experience. It was totally experience. If you had asked me before we saw these, these numbers, because I didn't know which one was worse, I would have told you 2000 to 2002 was deeper, which is the frustrating part. If you're in your 50s or your 60s or your 70s and you have a lot of money in stocks, I can see that panic because of the fact that you're, you're pretty close to wanting to spend that money. But I really get frustrated if you're listening and you're in your 20s or your 30s. I think this is not the time to panic. It's the time to do exactly what, well, it's not time for anybody to panic, but you know what I mean? That's when I get really frustrated is when I see somebody in their twenties go, I'm not going to invest right now because of the fact that the market's so shaky. Are you kidding me? You're just starting out. You're just starting. Yep. Now's the time. Absolutely. Hey, it's time for our TikTok minute. This is where we shine the light on a TikTok creator doing some amazing stuff. And sometimes the amazing is in air quotes. Amazing. That happens a fair amount on TikTok. Sometimes it really is uh, a good lesson for us all. OG, is this one going to be an eye roll or is this some good stuff? No, no, this is good. This one's good. This one's going to be good. All right. You know, those, uh, those videos out there where the pizza guy shows up at the door and the person doesn't have any money. Hmm. What sort of video genre are you talking about, Joe? I have, I have no idea, but this TikTok producer does. Let's listen in. One large sausage pizza? Oh no, I don't have any money. I think I know what you could pay. So it's going to be 30% interest for three months and you just sign right there. <laughs> there it is. I got a way you can pay. Cute. Wow. See what they did yeah. there. Yes. That was clever. A little shucking and jiving. Yes. Some some fun TikTok creation there. Thanks to Katie for sending that in to us. That's uh, some pretty funny stuff, Katie. Uh, if you've got a TikTok video that you saw that you think makes a good point about money, don't pay the interest, OG. Don't pay the 30% interest. Don't get sucked into that game. On a pizza. On a pizza. I don't know. I've actually, some pizzas are more worth 30% interest than anything else I've ever bought. Like there are moments in your life where you're like, yeah, sign me up. I don't care. Make it 40%. I need that pie right now. It, do it doesn't matter. I need the pie in my pie hole right now. Put it in my Steph. face. Yes. Immediately. Well, I love our next guest for several reasons, which we'll outline here. But one is, I was a financial planner for 16 years before embarking on this financial media expedition. And this this guest today did something very similar. He spent 17 years as a feature writer for the Philadelphia Bulletin. He was a magazine writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, investigative journalist for Philadelphia Magazine. Dude loves Philly, doesn't he? And stringer for Time Life News Service, Willard Stern Randall pursued advanced studies in history after all that. Decided, you know what? I'm going to do something different. Sounds very familiar. Went back to Princeton to pursue advanced studies in history. Biographer of Benjamin and William Franklin, Benedict Arnold, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Ethan Allen. Heard a few of those people before, OG. Those people, those names might ring a bell. Yeah, they make nice furniture. <laughs> they do. Oh, Ethan, I've shopped there. He's co-authored collections of biographies and eBooks with his wife, the biographer and award-winning poet, Nancy Nara. And uh, man, he's won all kinds of awards. He won the National Magazine Award for Public Service from Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. He's won the Hancock Prize and his Benedict Arnold biography, received four national awards and was a New York Times notable book. Willard Stern Randall. I mean, just think about what this guy could have accomplished if he just applied himself. I know, if, he, if he got a little focused. Willard Stern Randall, now here with us. I'm sure the highlight of his career, this is going on the biography, coming down to the basement to talk with us about founding fortunes, some of the notable people that had a ton financially at stake to make this nation move. And today he's going to talk about two of them with us. We're going to chat about a little guy named George Washington, if you're familiar with him. Good looking dude. George Washington and Ben Franklin. In a second, we'll say hello to Willard Stern Randall, but I think, Doug, you've got some trivia for us. Thought you'd never ask, Joe. Ten long years ago, 
We in the basement, in order to form the greatest money show on earth, establish financial literacy, ensure potty humor, provide for the common bank portfolio, promote the General Benjamin, and secure the blessings of Joe's mom to ourselves and our posterity, did ordain and establish the Stacking Benjamin Show. One plague, and seven years ago, these men brought forth on this podcast a new conversation, conceived in hilarity and dedicated to the proposition that all stocks are not created equal. So, my question to you, fine audience, is how many of you listen in per week to keep this vision going? Is it about 50,000, about 100,000, or over 150,000 stackers per week? I'll be back with the answer right after I sign my Herbie Hancock on these here bouncy checks. Well, if the holidays got you down and the blues lasted all the way through January, have no fear, stackers, because Navy Federal Credit Union has multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals and to take back control of your finances after the holidays. They offer digital tools and educational resources to help guide your decisions. With Navy Federal, you can automate your savings and investing to start putting your money to work for you even as you sleep. Plus, you can even buy fractional shares. And if you are paying too much interest to the man, well, you can also get their low intro APR on their platinum credit card. It's their lowest rate card, and it's a great tool to help you reduce your interest payments while you're paying down debt. Learn more about all of that at NavyFederal.org. It's NavyFederal.org. Message and data rates may apply. Savings products insured by NCUA investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. The following is an actor, not a real person. We tried to find an actual Stacking Benjamins podcast listener, but we're not sure any exist. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number, you're family. Stacking Benjamins, where you're not a number, you're family. Hey there, stackers. I'm future downtown Texarkana Plaza statue and compounding father, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You all have kept this podcast nation strong, stacking Benjamins with us three times a week, watching Joe shrink from a man to an old man, and creating your legacy along with ours. So how many of you stackers listen in each week? More than 150,000. And we can't thank you enough for your support. Here's to four score and seven years more. As long as we're all going to live that long. Here to help us understand the risk and rewards of our shaky endeavors, it's Willard Stern Randall. And here he is coming down the stairs to the basement. Will Stern Randall joins us. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy that you're here with us. And obviously with a name like Stacking Benjamins, we're very interested in anything that talks about Ben Franklin Before we get to Ben Franklin, I want to ask you specifically about after the revolution and uh, uh, George Washington has accepted the job to be the first president of the United States. But it sounds to me like he is not really excited about this job. He did not really want to be first president of the United States. I think he felt a very strong sense of duty, but more than that, He loved being at home. He had been in the field as a soldier for five years and then eight years. And he'd made this beautiful home, but he never had time in it. He wanted to retire. He had moved 280 times during the revolution from field headquarter to tent on the run, basically. He wanted nothing more than to settle down at Mount Vernon and and enjoy it. But he also saw that what he had helped create wasn't working. The, the United States was not working. It had so many flaws in its original Articles of Confederation that you really had 13 banana republics competing with each other, taxing each other, not cooperating on anything. He also wanted to open up the inside of the country. He wanted, he wanted people to be able to get on a ship in Europe and sail up the Potomac and wind up in Ohio. 
uh, and then go down to the Mississippi. He had this big plan, but he couldn't get past Maryland, which wouldn't agree with him because Maryland said, well, we want the tolls. I mean, it came down to nickel and dime. And he thought that the only one who could settle this was himself if he agreed to take the job. Your your book does a wonderful job at going into the personal motivations that they had. And that was from a big perspective. But you also point out that he had uh, he had not been paid during the, the revolution. Besides, I think you point out that he had some money that had been returned to him, but he hadn't been paid during that whole time. He had tenant farmers that were were not paying their rent. So he had to evict the tenant farmers because of problems going on in shipping and in trade. And so he really, he really needed the money. That's right. And I, I get some pushback from people, George Washington, why wasn't he the richest American? Uh, well, it, if you have a hundred thousand acres of land and you can't get the rent from one acre, uh, you're not that rich. And that was going on all over the country. What had happened is the British, as soon as they surrendered on paper, at least put the blocks to us economically and cut off our trade. So the country went into a steep depression and it wasn't pulling out because its political structure wasn't strong enough to set up banks or any of the things that they needed. So here's George Washington, no pension, can't collect the rents. He can't even afford a decent lifestyle at Mount Vernon, as he wrote to his relatives when he said, OK, I'm going to do it. He didn't say uh, there's no other way. He said, but I really have to do it. How much did the job of first president pay? That's a good question. I worked it out, and it's about, in our dollars today, about $750,000 a year. <laughs> so that's a, uh, At the time, that's... it wasn't anything like that, but he went from zero pay to live very well, pay his debts, keep Martha in, in the latest fashions, etc. That's a nice carrot to dangle in front of somebody who's reticent and who wants to, wants to retire. You, well, it's about what a college president gets today to put it in perspective, believe it or not. Let's dive into another of our founding fathers. Uh, Probably you could easily call him our favorite because of the name of our show, Ben Franklin. You begin your book by talking about Franklin and Franklin coming from Boston. He heads to New York. Tell us about the early days of Ben Franklin and really a struggling Ben Franklin. It sounds like. Well, he was a runaway. He was trying to get away from his family. He stowed away on a ship. The ship was going to New York. He basically fooled the captain of the ship into thinking there was a young lady involved and he had to get out of town. So he got to New York and thought, well, I can get a printing job here, but there weren't any. And then in New York, they said, well, why don't you try Philadelphia? And he, he, yeah, and he ends up in Philadelphia and, uh, it sounds like fairly quickly makes his way. You know, we talk a lot about different financial topics on this show and going back to Washington earlier, one problem we've always talked about with real estate is if you need money right now, you can't go rip off your bathroom and say, and and sell it in a hurry, you know, to, to, to repair the muffler of your car. So there's Washington's problem right there. He's got all this money in land that he can't get to. Uh, When it comes to Franklin, though, Franklin very quickly, it sounds like, realizes that going from working for somebody else to becoming an entrepreneur really is where his bread's going to be buttered. Well, he was a very skilled printer. On his way of crossing New Jersey to get to Philadelphia, he stopped long enough to print the currency of New Jersey. So he had that kind of skill. He knew when he got to Philadelphia, there were more printers. Philadelphia was the biggest town in the colonies. He was able to click right away. And with his skill and his energy, he was able to sort of shoulder his way into printing in Philadelphia. And then he basically was fooled by the royal governor into thinking, if you go to London, I'll give you a printing press. So that probably one of the two biggest mistakes he made in his life. But in in London, he learned his skill, but he also learned the book publishing business. And that's the secret to his wealth, not job printing or bringing out the Pennsylvania Gazette. He saw that the real money was printing books and then making partnerships with other printers. So he would print the original pages, the sheets, and ship them to somebody in Virginia or Boston, and they would bind it. And he got half of everything they sold. He was a brilliant entrepreneur. Yeah, and I love uh, your discussion of all the partnerships that he had. 
and this idea that we still have today that partnerships are the key to life and, and who you know is definitely important in working with other people. But he also was a very skilled writer. Uh, you point out that his first biggest success, I would suppose, would be the Almanac? Yes, it was because it was it was a perennial. He developed a following. He sold 10,000 copies a year in a population of only about 100,000 people who could have bought it. Wow. Uh, so he's getting cash every year. He did that for 25 years. It would be in the millions today. Why did it sell so well? Well, almanacs until that time were really just like charts of the heavens, the tides, uh, when to plant your beans. And he said, no, no, people want to be entertained. So he came up, he, he was really good at the literary hoax. He would make up whoppers. <laughs> he understood his clientele, just country bumpkins in a way, and loved, loved nothing more than rib tickling humor. So he faked all sorts of things. He did it all the way to Paris, where he was our ambassador, pretending love affairs with aristocrats and all. But that's what really caught on. He, he knew where the funny bone was. One of his biggest partnerships that you point out early on was with a gentleman named George Whitefield. And before we get to uh, his partnership with Whitefield, tell us the story, if you don't mind, about Whitefield. Because this guy was a, I don't know if you call him a real character. Well, I, I guess he would be a real character, wasn't he? Yeah, he'd have a private jet now right. um, and be going from evangelical rally to evangelical rally. He was a student at Oxford and he formed a club with other theology students at Oxford University in England. They went down among the workers on the waterfronts during a strike. And he realized that if he could if he could preach loudly to the masses, that he would have a huge following. So he came to America and every year for six years, he went all the way down the coast, all the colonies getting these huge crowds. So when he got to Philadelphia, uh, Franklin had heard that uh, 25,000 people were going to turn out. And Franklin was, he was a good mathematician as well as a skeptic. So he went and he walked around the periphery of the crowd and then divided it by two and a half square feet, which he made up as a measure of crowds. And by the way, it works. And then he could validate it was 25,000 people. And that meant that George Whitfield was projecting his voice to more than the population of Philadelphia at the time. And that's what he did everywhere. Whitfield went all over uh, with two horses. He was on one and the other one had a portable pulpit. So even if the regular clergy threw him out or wouldn't let him in, the crowds followed him. He also hooked up with Franklin because Franklin could publicize him by sending newspaper articles ahead of him before he reached town. Franklin then decided there's money in this. So he hooked up right after that first crowd scene with Whitfield and said, how about if I publish your sermons? And that's where Franklin made his bundle. I heard a story speaking of Whitfield and making a big production before he came into town and kind of what seems to me a little bit of a P.T. Barnum uh, kind of way to mix ages. But I read a story elsewhere that George Washington very much did the same thing in his later years, that he knew of what people expected of him. And tell me if this is a fiction or not, or if you even know, did George Washington kind of do the same thing in his later years where he would leave his nice carriage that he was in, get on a horse and ride into towns because people expected him to be this gallant man on a horse? That's exactly right. He would do that. So he rode around in a pretty nice carriage with four or six matched horses, uh, like a duke. But that's not the image he wanted when he went into a town to, to be approachable. But he knew that people also wanted some grandeur, some memory of winning the revolution. So he always had a white horse with him. He would get on his white horse, sit very tall, and he was already six foot four with his big cocked hat on and ride like a statue into town while the adoring masses cheered. <laughs> it, it shows you that how much perception is reality. And people do that on social media today. It's, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of similarities. Uh, Whitfield, just to give people an idea of what a fantastic speaker was, I'm going to quote from your book uh, something that, uh, that Ben Franklin had written. You write that Franklin's well aware when he first meets Whitfield that he's a great speaker and he knows that it's going to end with a collection, that, that, that Whitfield needs to raise money in every town he goes to. Yeah. So, so Franklin writes, 
uh, and this is directly from your book. I perceived he intended to finish with a collection and I silently resolved that he should get nothing from me. I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars and five pistols in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften and concluded to give him the coppers. Another stroke of his oratory made me ashamed of that and determined me to give the silver. And he finished so admirably that I emptied my pockets wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. This guy was a great, not a good speaker. He was a great speaker. He was a great speaker or a great something to be able to get any money out of Benjamin Franklin. You make a point early on about a theory in the early 1900s that a lot of the signers of the Constitution, obviously, they believed in the the idea of the United States. They believed in separation from uh, the British, but also there was something in it for them personally. And as I'm reading this first chapter, it it strikes me that for Ben Franklin, not only was he great at partnerships and a great writer and a skilled entrepreneur, but also he learned how to get himself into these great government positions, which gave him a stronger financial position. Like you write in the book that he became postmaster general and he was a great postmaster general, but he also got to send his stuff postage free <laughs> because of the fact that he was postmaster general. We call that when our government officials do it now, the franking privilege. It should be the Franklin privilege because he really invented that too. He always got onto an expense account, uh, which was very rare. Um, in, in a way, he was the only member of the Continental Congress that was paid. He got his first. But then he wasn't delivering just the mail. He was delivering convoys of gunpowder to Washington, and the government was reimbursing him for his expenses along the way. I want to switch over for just a moment to George Washington, and we're not going to have enough time with you today to dive into so much of what George Washington did. But I do want to talk about the early days and George Washington kind of learning to make his way in the world. That seems to have been from his family lineage. Like a lot of George Washington's ancestors, they failed a lot. As I'm reading your writing, a lot of Washington's history is based on failure. I think that's a brilliant observation, frankly. He was a master of parlaying disaster into promotion and uh, rewards. I mean, here, here's a man who lost more battles than he won, but he was with the Braddock expedition that was wiped out in Pennsylvania. He was the only officer surviving unscathed. He gave the losing advice to Braddock that ended in disaster. He got us into the French and Indian Wars by ambushing a French diplomat uh, in the forests of Pennsylvania. He lost one battle after another, but he, he had two skills. One, he was so honest. And two, he was good at self-publicity. He would write the reports that got to the governors and got into the newspapers. Like Franklin, he understood the very early the importance of publicity. Because he was likable as well and modest seeming, uh, he was rewarded again and again, more expense accounts, servants, cash. If you looked at like a baseball score, he was sort of zero and four at bat, except for Trenton and Princeton and helping the French win the final battle at Yorktown. He had more defeats, but people loved him. He was popular. And here's a guy who sat on a horse for eight years through horrible weather leading his men. He stayed in a tent till they all had cabins built for them in Valley Forge or wherever they were. So it was this brave, solid, likable fellow. And he was rewarded again and again for it. I love that tale of resilience because I feel like so often we give up on our goals, we give up on ourselves. And just looking at the resilience that Washington had is a great reminder, I think, especially early here in the new year about what's achievable. You know, I know you've been at this for a long time. This is obviously not your first rodeo, not your first book. I'm sure there's still something that as you were doing this research surprised you. Was there anything while you were making this book that was particularly surprising as you were doing this project? Yes, how little these people got out of it in material gains going through it all. I went through a graduate school where everybody believed in somebody named Charles Beard, who was at Columbia at the turn of the 20th century, and said these people were all in it for the money. And what I found out is if they were in it for the money, they weren't very good at it. 
uh, the financier of the revolution, who signed 6,000 personal notes to pay Washington soldiers so they could go home. He ended up in a debtor's prison. Robert Morris wound up in a debtor's prison for three years, where Washington visited him in debtor's prison and had lunch with the man who had paid his army. I mean, uh, Washington, we've already talked about how things were not working out financially for him before the presidency. Franklin did very, very well, but the British occupied Philadelphia, destroyed many of his rental properties, which were the basis of his income, trashed his house and stole his and his wife's portrait and threw him on a cart. So he he took a personal hit. Uh, He wasn't making money on it. And there were a lot of small time town figures who signed the Constitution and they had invested all they had in war bonds, which were worthless. And what I did was discover what they put in and what it was worth at the time. Two, three years later, when the finances were straightened out of the government, they had gained maybe 10 percent on their investment in in three years time. So if they went in for, for the money, they didn't come out with the money. What they got was an independent country, which was what they were after. The book is The Founders' Fortunes. I found all these stories just absolutely fascinating and so much that we can take with us today. And I'm assuming it's available everywhere. I hope it will be available everywhere. (laughs) Absolutely. And support your independent bookstores, people. When the book comes out, the day this is released, it's out tomorrow. So congratulations on another successful launch. And uh, thanks for joining us to talk about Franklin and Washington. I really appreciate it. It's been a great pleasure being interviewed by somebody who knows so much about the subject. This is Rebecca from Connecticut. Instead of stacking Hamiltons and Jacksons, I'd much rather be stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Willard Stern Randall for coming down to the basement. Oh, gee, he makes a great point. Sometimes it's not about the money. (laughs) Sometimes it's about, uh, about doing the right thing. These people had a lot of money that they, that they had at stake and, um, Mm -hmm. Not a lot of upside. And man, you just look at George Washington. Dude lost battle after battle. He won one. He won one battle. The important one. Yeah. Yep. It's uh it is quite amazing when you think about like all of the things that had to conspire to have all, all of that stuff happen and put all of those people in the same place at the same time, all thinking about the same thing. Pretty uh pretty amazing. And uh what an amazing gentleman Willard is as well. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, Doug. Uh, finding a Taylor Swift song where she's happy with her ex-boyfriend? <laughs> that's, 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 that's a worthwhile endeavor. If they can do that, then they are a miracle company. <laughs> well, what they can do is give you more time to go digging for that lost treasure because they make their application super simple. It's all online. You'll get instant coverage decisions, saving you time for those important times in life. Affordable prices, and of course, they're issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old. And today we're going to do something a little different. We're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to to Reddit because, oh gee, you pointed us toward uh, the Wall Street Bets Forum. And this person who says, last hurrah before turning to professional help. Hi, guys. I'm a, we'll redact that word, 22-year-old that screwed up big time. The person writes, I need help figuring out what I should do about this tax liability predicament that I find myself in. Let me take you on a journey of my bad personal decisions of the past two years. My first mess up, we'll change that word, was discovering options in April of 2020. (laughs) My my first mistake, OG, discovering options. When stonks only went up, I put in hours to become acquainted with market terminology and studied options, strats, and stocks, strats. Of course, in the beginning, it was a fun roller coaster. Ultimately, I ended up doubling my 5K account before I popped the question to the parents, can I trade your money? So it was $5,000 account doubled to 10. I doubled it I got this, Dad. once in a hugely up market. This is, this is, this is safe. Little did I know this jump would ruin my health and wealth. In November, 2020, I'd experienced massive loss and was down 50,000 on our principal. Then I found out about SPAC investing 
and shot up 150,000 before the end of 2020. I was pumped. I paid taxes the following year and all was good. Early in 2021, I hit it big on GME and more SPACs and made 200,000 in an account still in my name. I then sold and transferred all that money over into account my parents' name. This was my biggest mistake. Then came the crash of SPAC and popular growth stocks that sheep retail investors like myself scooped up. Long story short, my parents' account ended minus 300,000 in 2021. What was the stock market up in 2021, OG? 27%. But the original account, my name, is listed up 200,000 on the year. I can't file jointly with my parents, so I don't know how to effectively file so that the IRS considers my family's trading account joint. In other words, how do I avoid this huge tax bill that I can't afford? I'm an unemployed recent college graduate who's already managed to ruin his life. I'd really appreciate any input as I'm really feeling the implications of my actions. Shame me, console me, advise me, notice me, internet, please help. Man, I'm so, we'll say screwed. Uh, not what he says. I can't believe I'd be on a forum like this. It's like one of those old school letters that you used to read. I never thought this would happen to me. Yeah. But there I was at a diner. All of a sudden, and, and all of a sudden the tax person is sitting across from me going, hey, how can we be better let's friends? Let's just kind of summarize what he did here. So he had a trading account, you know, presumably a regular brokerage account, took mom and dad's money, put it in his account. It went up a whole bunch. Then he sold it out. So his brokerage account shows plus 200K on the year. Sold it out, put it in mom and dad's name. Has a $300,000 loss on the year. So mom and dad have a $300,000 loss on their account. He's got 200K gain on his account. In his mind, it's the same money. What does the IRS think of this? Tough patooties. <laughs> Yep. I can't see a solution here where you can do what he wants to do, which is like aggregate all the money. Like, well, it was all kind of sort of the same thing. He has a gain in his account. And what he wants to do is offset his gain with the loss from the parents account. I just don't see how that I don't see how that would ever happen. He's got another problem, too, though shifting money. I mean, it might not end up being a huge problem, but isn't there some gift tax returns that got to be filed back and forth here too? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Let's write that one. He's so worried about the t the tax issue, the capital gains. Be like, oh, don't forget your gift tax filing by the end of the year also, unless you want it to count against your lifetime gift exemption of a million. But uh, from what I understand on uh, what I've been told from, from some attorneys here on the gift taxes, that there's no statute limitations on filing a gift tax return. So technically he could wait until the end to file a gift tax return That's from good. this year. Just don't forget to do it. Yeah. But you're right. It's like when people say, Hey, I want to help my kids out with, with buying their house. How do I give them a hundred K? It's like, well, you really can't. I mean, you can, but you're, have to pay taxes on it or you have to account for it somehow. You know, that's the limit 16,000 this year. So you can do 32, you know, if you're married, you can do 64. If your kid's married, you, you know, everybody gives everybody 16,000, but that's an issue I hadn't thought about on the gifting side. So yeah. He, so he's got to come up with 20%, $40,000 out of an account that's got negative 300 K in it. Hey, mom and dad, great news. The account that I gave you, I've lost 300000 in. I also need to sell forty k to pay my tax bill. But good news, you get to carry forward negative 3000 for the next 100 years on your tax returns. So I think there's a reason when you're trading, well, there's several reasons why you trade with very little money. But one of the reasons you trade with very little money are all these implications, all these little things. Like you can make small mistakes. Imagine if he just stuck with the 5000 doubled it to 10 and just made the little mistakes with this much smaller account still would have had some, maybe some problems. Well, not the back and forth problem of, of exchanging ownership of stocks, but um, you make so many bad moves when you first start, especially active trading, you make so many dumb moves and so many mistakes, which is a great reason to start with very little money. Turns out he's not quite the uh, Gordon Gecko he thought he was. No, but Hey, he discovered SPACs and made crap loads of money on them. Yeah. Yuppers. I don't, I don't know of a way to solve this. 
Can you say go on? No, but but I will say this. There is something in active trading to the idea of momentum, momentum trading. I mean, plenty of traders have found money, but I'll tell you what's essential for a momentum trader. Because what this guy got was the downside OG of momentum, which is the momentum at some point goes away. So if you're a momentum trader without Nexus strategy, you're just a roller coaster rider. You're you're trading the hot stuff, which at some point is going to revert to the mean. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's if you're looking at buying individual stocks, you have to recognize the way that you value that cash flow. Basically, what are you buying when you buy an individual company? You're buying the future profits, right? That's what you're saying. You're saying, I think that this thing's going to profit into the future. That's why the other day, uh, Facebook had a huge decline because their CFO said, I think we're not going to make $10 billion next year, where there's, there's a $10 billion cost coming because of the way that the iPhone's privacy settings are. And because they're investing so much money, too, in the metaverse. Sure. But it affects your profit, right? Yeah. So then you say, okay, well, that's going to affect the cash flow of the operations, going to affect the profit in the future. Therefore, the price of this stock is not worth what it was yesterday when I didn't know that you were going to spend an extra $10 billion, you know? And so if you're looking at the ubiquitous meme stocks, it is all momentum. And you're just playing the greater fool theory, you know? I mean, no one in their right mind looked at the cinema company amc and said this is where the money is <laughs> this is the, <laughs> you know I no think, one's been to any of these places in 18 months but damn it they're definitely gonna go up i am fairly certain that 20 dollar popcorn is where we're headed yeah exactly this is exactly where the momentum or, or, momentum was the thing that was the thing it was the only thing that it could have possibly been with some of those things and and anything that's a hot commodity, whether it's Bitcoin or SPACs or, or meme stocks or whatever it is, you are quite literally playing the greater fool theory. I hope there's a greater fool than me when I go to sell this. There was an article I read in the Wall Street Journal about, uh, and we talked about on the show, who actually made all the money right on, on the meme stocks. Yeah, we had Spencer Jacob on the show diving into that. Well, and even if they didn't make money, if they lost money, all they did was encourage you to do this more. Yeah. Yep. Which is Vegas's goal. Uh -huh. Just keep the trading alive. Bells and whistles. Yeah. Sucks uh, for this dude. It does. And I got to say this about them. I would never post that in a million years. Like I would not post that to Wall Street bets, but good on them for doing it. Because I think so many people can learn from this dude's mistake. Like so many people can learn from their mistake. So hooray to them for having the guts to, you know get out there and write this stuff down. Obviously they're still, uh, they're still anonymous, but, um, but I still wouldn't write it. I still would. It, it wouldn't have been me. It sucks. Yeah. Good on them for helping us all learn. Hey, if you've got a question directly for us, don't post it to wall street bets. Just send, send us an email stack or a voicemail rather stack com slash voicemail. And, uh, different than this person, you know what they missed out on? They missed out on the stacking Benjamins t-shirt. That's what they missed out on. They didn't get a t-shirt. Yeah. Yep. They couldn't, they couldn't do that because they posted to wall street bets instead of here. So their loss, but our gain stacking com slash voicemail for that. Uh, just a few things. If you want deeper dives, that's our 201. And we have a contest, by the way, for people signing up for the 201 and referring their friends. That ends next week, giving away a Sono speaker, five subscriptions to uh, Tiller Money, our friends at Tiller. Uh, big thanks to them for offering those subscriptions and five copies of, speaking of Willard Stern Randall, five copies of Founding Fortunes, one of our favorite board games here in the basement. And uh, we're throwing those in because we like the game so much. And of course, you know, the Ben Franklin talk today, it's a game that kind of follows Ben Franklin's philosophies, giving away those two. Stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 to sign up for the referral program and to dive deeper into these topics that we talk about on the show. Coming up on Wednesday, a fun show. We're going to help you make your money easier, make it money simpler, or simplify a lot of this stuff. So that's coming up then. Last but not least, if you, like the person on Reddit here, needs uh, better help in your corner to avoid some potentially horrible outcomes, OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackybenjamins.com slash 
OG for the link to their calendar and uh, think bigger about your, not about your finances, think bigger about your life. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG. Dream bigger with our good friend OG and his team. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Sure, Joe, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, what the hell's a score? Well, it's 20 years. I didn't Google it. I just know it. It's one of those things I just store in my brain. Second, how about a lesson from Willard Stern Randall? What you risk is sometimes far greater than the reward, but the benefit is people will remember your dedication and resolve to help them. And, you know, like someday name a podcast after you a few centuries after you're dead. But the big lesson? Founding a podcast is a lot like founding a nation. There's a lot of shouting. Some people get killed, you know, but that's to be expected. And you definitely don't do it for the money. Special thanks to Willard Stern Randall for joining us today. His book, The Founder's Fortunes, How Money Shaped the Birth of America, is available for the equivalent of two silver coins in 1776. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I finally got my butt back out to the movie theater. Haven't seen hardly any movies this year. And, and I want to kind of get on, on OG. I, I want to get in on some of these uh, movies that might be up for Oscars. So I cheated. I knew that the uh, Golden Globes were not televised this year for a lot of, I think, very good reasons. But they weren't televised. But I went and I dug in to see what was there because often that shows you. And one that was on the list was this movie by Paul Thomas Anderson. Doug, you a fan of Paul Thomas Anderson movies? Yes, yeah, some of his movies. Others I just don't get, but there's a few that I, I really do enjoy. Punch Drunk Love. Did you like Punch Drunk Love? It's funny you say that. That one's been on my list for a long time. I've heard great things about it. It's supposed to be, wasn't that one of Adam Sandler's like best roles? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was really good, but if you're looking for... Adam Sandler to be funny, right. like that is not that, that you are you are shopping at the wrong place. Yeah, I've heard that's the one where you go. Adam Sandler can act because he was really good. That's what I keep hearing. He was super good, but.
But a lot of his movies I haven't seen. Like, I didn't see Magnolia. I didn't see There Will Be Blood. I'd like to see There Will Be Blood. I've That's seen good. pieces of There Will Be Blood. So I'd, so I'd love to see that. I also haven't seen, I didn't see Boogie Nights. I didn't see Heart Eight. And you know, it's funny looking at this list, D- Doug, I don't think I've seen hardly. <laughs> yeah. So, but you're a big fan, are you, Joe? Well, well, it's <laughs> funny because I've heard him do three different interviews and I really like listening to him talk. I did see a movie of his that I hated and you and I actually talked about this movie after you saw it. And I told you big mistake, the master. Yes, that was a big mistake. And I watched it all the way through. You saw it just a few weeks ago. That movie's horrible. It wasn't long ago. And uh, yeah, I mean, some of the acting was really good. Actually, the acting was very good across the board. Uh, Amy Adams was really good in that. And why can't I think of uh, Joaquin the, Phoenix? N- well, yeah. But who was the lead? Um, who Phenomenal. Uh, Philip Seymour. That's it. Philip Seymour. But man, he, all three of them were phenomenal. But uh, just as a movie, pass nobody watch yes. it well with that with that mixed bag i went to see his latest movie which is called licorice pizza i met the girl i'm gonna marry one day listen young lady So how'd you become such a hotshot actor? I'm a showman. That's what I'm meant to do. Do you know who I am? Yeah. Do you know uh, who my girlfriend is? Barbara Streisand? <laughs> Barbara Streisand. Sand. Sand, yeah, like sands. Like the ocean, like beaches. Barbara Streisand? <sighs> no, like Streisand. Sand. That's Bradley Cooper, who's got a fantastic cameo in this movie where he is an actor married to Barbara Streisand. Streisand and Gary can't say Streisand. And he's just messing with the dude because Bradley Cooper's character is such a jerk in the movie. And they actually get into a lot of trouble trying to uh, enact some revenge on uh, Bradley Cooper for what a horrible human being he is here. And there's lots of, of course, when you have a uh, name brand director, there are so many cameos. Uh, Maya Rudolph shows up for one scene in this thing. And, uh, and you always around every corner, you're like, Oh, I think I know that person. So this movie is the story of this 15 year old guy who, and you heard that line, he's telling his little brother that he found the woman he's going to marry. He knows this woman he's going to marry. And he's a young, he's a child actor. He works a lot, but he meets this woman who's 25. And while he's a very mature 15, she's a very immature 25 years old. And uh, the story is about their relationship, which is not a relationship that you would think that it is. You know, when you hear a 15 year old and a 25 year old sounds super creepy, they have a weird relationship. It is incredibly weird as they are two people that can't stand each other and also really, really seem to be kindred spirits. You know, it's funny. I saw this movie almost a week ago and, uh, I left the movie theater. I didn't know what to think. Like I cannot, number one, I can't recommend this movie. I can't recommend it because too many people are going to hate it because you're going to get halfway through it. And you're like, where the hell is this going? I like movies though, with strong characters and the characters here are so strong. They are so strong and you get to know these people so well that for me, I enjoyed it. But I think your revolt, your results are seriously going to vary. <laughs> You're seriously going to vary. You're like, w- why am I watching these two just messed up people for two plus hours? It just seems like a, I don't know, a tr- sometimes, you know, we talk about OG, a train wreck in slow motion. Now that's fun to watch. This is a train wreck that the train was going like four miles an hour and then it gets in a wreck, right? <laughs> So there's no part of it that's interesting. There's no, there's no violence. There's no crash, bam, boom. It just slowly no hits. Tanks, no yeah, explosions. No, it just slowly hits the car and maybe even bounces off of it. And you're like, yeah, train wreck. It, it was too slow in too slow motion. So licorice pizza. I thought it was a fun ride, but like we walked out of the theater and Cheryl goes, what the hell did we just see? Like, what did we see? And I'm like, I don't know. I I don't know. I, I love how you just go through this whole long description. You're like, I loved it, but 149,500 of you are going to hate it. So don't watch it. But let's talk about it for five minutes. 
I think at least two thirds of our audience is going to hate this movie. I just watch, I watch a ton of movies. I go watch, oh gee, you and I have been talking movies long enough. You will hate it. You, there's no way you like this movie. Like, I, d- I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I'm sure, I'm sure the preview's been on, but it's so, it's so not interesting yes. to me that I don't even know. I, we lost OG, a movie about a relationship. I thought I heard snoring. <laughs> yeah. So not a thumb down, but can't recommend. View at your own risk. <laughs>